OK, so this lecture is going to cover another response to uh, Gettier's central objection to the justified true belief account of knowledge. And I'm going to assume that we're comfortable with some of the central issues that we've covered so far. This would be an answer to a kind of 25 mark essay question, something along the lines of is propositional knowledge best defined as justified true belief? So remember the central point uh, and generator of this debate as we get into it was Gettier's objection, which the, is that the three conditions are not sufficient for knowledge. They are enough to have knowledge because you can still have elements of luck uh, with the JTB conditions in place. So this relates to the Smith and Jones type example, the stopped clock examples, the fake barns, uh, various examples which are supposed to show that the simple lump sum of justification, truth and belief does not generate knowledge. So we've looked at various ways of improving on this uh, traditional account and trying to meet Gettier's challenge. So infallibilism, try to deal with Gettier examples by making only that which cannot be rationally doubted knowledge. There are problems with this, which you can recap on in your own time. And we had also the no false lemmas uh, response, which tried to say that nothing uh, which relies on a false assumption or false belief uh, can be knowledge as well. So this also was intended to get around the kind of stopped clock Smith and Jones type examples, which had its own problems. So as you go through this essay, you would be expected to outline these responses to Gettier and try and show whether they actually work in giving us a more intuitive and believable account of knowledge, which is rigorous and avoids these kinds of examples. OK, so we're going to move on to a third response to Gettier in this lecture, and it's going to depend partly on an important distinction within epistemology, which is the distinction between internalism and externalism. So we can think about it in this kind of way. Let's say that you believe, uh, for instance, that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the world. How do you know this? What you use as justification is going to open up a difference in epistemology between internalists and externalists. So what was it you thought of when you thought of your justification for knowing that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the world? Did you think of something specific? Was it perhaps a lesson, a book or something along those lines? Or could you perhaps not think of anything at all? This is going to be important in how we set out our third reliabilist uh, response to Gettier's problem. So let's start with the internalists then. So an internalist would say that if you cannot think of any supporting evidence for your belief, then you can't really have knowledge because you can't point to any specific reasons to believe it. So knowledge for internalists is grounded by your own experience and your ability to reason. So they're going to place special emphasis on what is available to you through the first person perspective. If you can't see for yourself why you should believe something, then you don't actually know it on this account. So the person's own awareness of good grounds is essential to what distinguishes knowing from other states like simply guessing. So the internalist case has been made by a philosopher called uh, Bonjour, uh, and he's going to describe internalism's view of justification as depending, as he puts it, on elements that are internal to the believer's conscious states of mind in a way that makes them accessible to his conscious reflection, at least, he says, in principle. So this would include certain beliefs that I have or memories that I can detect by introspection, that is by looking inwards and reflecting on the contents of my own mind. So on this reading, infallibilism and no false lemmas would be in internalist accounts because they depend on our internal reasons for believing something. So reasons that we can reflect on. I might think of the book in which I learnt that Everest was the tallest mountain in the world. I might think of the lesson where I was taught that or the discussion that I had or perhaps the quiz in which it came up as a question and I checked the answer. 
So I can reflect on my reasoning, going back to the Gettier cases about the clock, and work out that I wrongly believed that it was working. So in the No False Lemmas account, that's a kind of internalist account of justification where I can work through the reasons that I had in my own mind and I can correct that uh, and work out that this in fact wasn't knowledge. The externalist takes a different view. So the externalist uh, is going to assert that justification for knowledge does not essentially depend on what is accessible to the knower's first person perspective from within your own um, mind or perspective. The externalist is going to emphasize the relationship between a person or a knower and a fact. And this relationship can be in place when a person does not have supporting first person access to the grounds for believing it. So if it really is true that Everest is the tallest mountain and that you are related to the fact in the right sort of way, then you know it, even if you can't point to the specific first person evidence of why you believe it. So reliabilism is one such externalist theory, and that tries to be specific about this idea of the right sort of way in which you're related to the facts. So reliabilism is going to point to reliable processes uh, or reliable ways of getting at the truth. And we might, for instance, consider, you know, our news sources, some of which are reliable, some of which are less reliable. This idea of reliability as consistency and getting to the truth is the centre of this reliabilist response. So there are lots of ways in which we generate our beliefs. Some of them are justified, some of them are less justified. Here are some examples that you could have a think about. Which of these might you think is reliable? Which is less so? And what does that tell us about the way in which we form our beliefs? So reliabilism wants to stress this notion of getting to the truth consistently. So we might have a amended definition here, which Gnosis drops the J and says that knowledge is a true belief plus a reliable process or a true belief formed through a reliable process. This would be the reliabilist definition of knowledge. So. One of the defenders of this view, Alvin Goldman, contrasts faulty belief making processes, which typically produce unjustified beliefs such as hunches, confused reasoning, wishful thinking and guesswork with reliable ones which typically get at the truth, such as perception, memory, good reasoning and introspection or looking inwards to your own mind. What makes this then an externalist theory? Well, the point that the reliabilist wants to make and emphasize is that it's not necessary that you be aware of or know your belief is formed by a reliable process to know the thing in question. What matters is that it is formed by a reliable process which consistently gets you to the truth. You don't have to have, in other words, reflective knowledge of the processes or to have thought about how it is that you're coming about these truths. You just have to consistently get to the truth. Now, this is an advantage, perhaps, because it can explain how um, knowers who don't have that reflective awareness can still have knowledge. So specifically for young children, perhaps, uh, and animals can know things without having clear internal beliefs about their reasoning. So if your dog knows when it's dinner time or who their owners are or all sorts of other examples I'm sure you could generate, you could say, well, yes, they genuinely do know things about what is the case in the world, but they don't have the ability to reflect on their reasons and say, well, this is how I know it. They just know because they can consistently get to the truth in that way. 
that is the kind of motivating force uh, and the advantage, I think, of reliabilism in responding to Gettier type examples. OK, so reliabilism is giving us an externalist account of justification. It's saying that if you are related to the facts in the correct kind of way, then you have knowledge. So it doesn't depend on your own internal reasons or beliefs about the processes at which you arrive at the truth. It's, it's saying that as long as you are using a process which consistently gets you to the truth, then you have knowledge. So this is supposed to get around some of the kind of Gettier cases that we've looked at so far. So you might want to go back to some of the examples from the booklet and ask yourself, does the person in the example have knowledge, would you say? Uh, and then what would a reliabilist say? Were these truths arrived at through reliable processes? And how could the reliabilist deal with these kind of lucky coincidences? Just to take the standard example that I've been referring to of the stopped clock, we might say in this instance that if we take the case of the stopped clock, we could argue that from a reliabilist perspective, that the belief here is not knowledge because looking at stopped clocks is not a reliable process for arriving at the truth. So they would want to try and say that the process by which you had the, the truth in this case was an unreliable process. It's not one which will consistently get you to the truth. This, however, does generate a problem for reliabilism. Can you see what the problem might be given the way that we framed the response here to the stopped clock example? So there is a problem for reliabilism, and this goes back to uh, the fake barn type example that we looked at previously. And Alvin Goldman uh, was the defender of reliabilism who came up with this example. Um, and the criticism of reliabilism here is usually known as the generality problem. So this important objection focuses on how we define a reliable process and how specific or general that definition needs to be. So in the fake barn example, Barney doesn't have knowledge as the mechanism for spotting fake barns is rendered unreliable by the context of being in fake barn county. So he can't recognize genuine from fake barns due to the context. And that's why uh, his instance of uh, belief there is not knowledge. But it fails to deliver the same verdict if we generalize the context and say something like vision, something more general, is the method for forming beliefs here. This would, on most accounts, still be reliable in fake Barn County. After all, Barney uses it to navigate the road, check his speed and all sorts of other things that he knows. We seem to be making an exception for the belief about the fake Barn and real Barn. So there's a problem in the way that we're defining reliable processes here. We might think similarly of the clock. Usually looking at clocks is a good way to get to the truth about the time. It's only once we specify looking at stopped clocks that we get to the problem. So to fill out this problem a little bit. It is only by being more specific about fake Barn County that we get the judgment that Barney's method of belief formation is unreliable. Likewise, it's only by being more specific about the fact that the clock had stopped that we get the judgment there that the method of belief form formation is, is unreliable. The problem is that if we carve up any example in this way to be specific and generate knowledge, then any true belief can be made to count as knowledge. For instance, only by looking at working clocks or only believing the president of the company when he is 100 percent correct, only um, looking at barns when they're not surrounded by fake barns and so on and so on. On the other hand, if we leave the definition of the process too general, 
for instance visual perception, then we end up letting in too many beliefs that may be false, like illusions, hallucinations, mere mistakes from tiredness, and so on. So without an appropriate definition of reliable processes, it seems this theory lacks the explanatory power to be able to distinguish genuine knowledge from merely lucky belief. So to wrap up on reliabilism, there is an excellent case which I'd like you to have a look at, which is on YouTube, which is The Boy with the Incredible Brain, about a man called Daniel Tammet, who seems to be able to do all sorts of things from doing incredible kind of uh, calculations in his head without apparently knowing how he is doing them. So he is what's sometimes called a savant, someone who has these extraordinary powers and abilities without really knowing how it is that he gets to the truth. So he has in this case, with the great big math sums, no internal justification for this knowledge, but he appears to get the correct answer every time. So you might want to reflect, does this show that reliabilism and a sort of externalist view of knowledge is a better way to approach knowledge? Uh, or do we need these internal reasons? Should we be able to reflect on and articulate our own reasons for believing the things that we know? OK, so overall for reliabilism, we need to understand what it means to say that it's an externalist theory. In other words, it doesn't depend on factors which are consciously available to or that you could reflect on on your own internal uh, perspective. It's just about being in the right relationship to the truth, according to reliabilism. So it gets around the Gettier cases by redefining knowledge as a true belief arrived at by a reliable process. In other words, one which typically gets to the truth. So for instance, the stopped clocks don't reliably tell the right time. So that example would not count as knowledge because it isn't arrived at by a reliable process. There's not the right relationship between your belief and the truth in this instance.